Hi everyone and welcome to episode 20 of Stuttering, Demystified and Beyond. I am your host, Laurie Melnitsky, speech language pathologist, stuttering specialist and ADHD life coach. In this episode, as we delve further into ADHD and executive functioning, I am thrilled and excited to bring on a very special guest to interview who I've waited to share her story and her interview with you. In today's episode, I bring on Leah Fradkin, who is my 24-year-old daughter, and she really has a lot of great information to share with you about ADHD and executive functioning. Leah? Welcome to my podcast. Hi, Mom. Hey, Lee. <laughs> okay. Um, Lee, I thought, well, why don't I just, uh, why don't we first share your age and where you go to school? Um, well, I'm 24. I'm a junior at Hofstra University, and I'm a public relations major. Nice. So maybe you can share with our audience why you felt it was really important to come on this podcast. I think, well, I'm someone, so I have ADHD and I'm dyslexic. Um, I'm someone who's gone through the school system and I, I'm one of the kids that kind of falls through the cracks because, you know, I scored well on all the standardized testing. I had good grades, but couldn't hand in homework or finish small projects. And the school system really didn't know what to do with me. So I just wanted to come on here to just say how, um, sorry, just say how people who think differently and that their minds are a little different and they think out of the box that it's a good thing. And I think the school system makes you believe that it's a bad thing. And I think ADHD and dyslexia is people think automatically that something's wrong with you. But I think those two things, me having those two things helps me think outside of the box and is the reason why I do so well. Because I use the positive traits with ADHD and dyslexia to my advantage. Okay. And... I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember about what age you started feeling like maybe you didn't learn like the others? Um, I think it's because I started in elementary school because I've always liked to learn. Um, I've always liked to read. My dad, with my dad, I grew up, we would read the newspaper every day. And at a certain point, I, I started to hate learning and I started to hate school. And I think that was around second grade um because i couldn't spell well and eventually i was able to cope and i ended up memorizing every almost every single word that i could that i could spell at the time so they pulled me out for services I able was to like finagle my way through that and um i came up with my own cope, coping mechanisms but it eventually came up to me caught up with me in around sixth grade. Right. And I think sixth grade was middle school here. And that was when you had to like start going to each individual class on your, your, your own. And you probably needed some more organizational skills that probably weren't learned, or maybe is it possible that it was at that point that you started feeling overwhelmed? Um, I just, I mean, I honestly didn't think there was anything wrong with me. I just knew the school system. The schools were just calling me lazy. They honestly, I was bullied by my teachers. They would call me out for not handing in homework. And because I was, I was social and I was a good communicator and I came with like my hair and makeup done, people didn't believe that I actually was facing difficulties. They would just say that I was lazy and I didn't want to complete homework. And then eventually, and what I mean by bullying is they would call, I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this through school, but they would call you out. They would call me out over the loudspeaker. Um, 
I had to go to CSC meetings and one time it was during a, a fire drill and I had to go outside in front of all my class with the whole CSC meeting. So I never really thought anything was wrong with me. Um, I saw quickly that I wasn't fitting into the mold and that really affected my self-esteem and my self-worth. And eventually I started to believe them. I mean, I even had people tell me that I wasn't going to graduate high school at such a young age. So it was never me. I have always been interested in things. I like to learn. It was really, I wasn't molding into the school system. That's what it was. Yeah, I hear you. And as a mom of course, hearing it now and experiencing it, it was, you know, hard to watch and my heart broke because as a young child, you love learning. I remember like bringing you to museums. You were always the one raising your hands. You were always interested. You were very verbal from a young age and, you know, everybody would say you were very worldly and it was very, and I probably did not handle it well at certain times because I didn't understand it either. And I didn't understand why you all of a sudden hated school. And I, and I was getting, you know, constant, you know, emails and calls from the schools. Eventually we did get a diagnosis of ADHD. And what you're describing is ADHD inattentive without the hyperactive activity part of it and yeah I mean I wish and I'm just trying to think do you think at the time there was a way that it just could have been handled differently well first of all I don't think you guys handled it badly because uh, <laughs> you guys both my nice. parents luckily I had both of my parents who fought for me I mean there's nothing you could you could have done it's just how the school system is set up. I mean, I remember at a CSC meeting, and for those who don't know what CSC meetings, it's when you discuss your services um, with everyone who's part of your team. So, so the so it, wait, I don't mean to interrupt. It's the committee on special ed. Yeah, so it'll be like your teachers and um, your research room teachers. And all those people who help you, help you in quotation, succeed in school. And I remember always from a young age wanting to be in those meetings. I mean, in middle school, they discourage kids to go into them. But I was like, if this is about me, I need to be there. And I feel like that's a big thing. There's like a disconnect. They think that the parents can change the child without even like asking the child what's wrong. They kind of go above you. But um, there was, there, there was nothing really you or dad could have done. I mean, by high, by high, but when I was in high school, I remember that's when they encourage you to participate in the CSC meetings and you just sit around and a bunch of people around a table tell you how you're a failure and how you're lazy. And I remember starting screaming at one of them, why would I want to go to school? It's like walking into a lion's den because I mean, once I got, it still affects me today. Like once I go into a school, I tense up. My hand was always in the fist because I just felt like I was always going to be attacked by someone. And I, obviously I don't mean physically attacked, but I feel like for some reasons, teachers forget what it's like to be a kid and you're nervous about fitting in and being embarrassed and feeling different and definitely different wasn't emphasized in a good way. So it's nothing my parents could have done the best it, they did the best they could do, but it was really, it's really just how the school system is formed. Right. And I mean, I do appreciate you saying that because, you know, as parents, we did the best we could. I started to realize over time that, you know, even with things like extended time or, a little extra time for homework that wasn't going to compensate um, for skills that were not learned, that you weren't being taught, that did not come automatically. Like I remember specifically, and actually we're in my office now, but I remember being in my office, you might have been actually probably in sixth grade and you had to do some 
kind of timeline. Um, and I remember you, I don't know if you remember this or not, and you like had to lay out pieces of paper in sequential order. And I remember like that overwhelm and you just like ran upstairs and I didn't understand why at the time. And you kind of hid in your room. And I realize now it was because one, you were being asked to do something um, that you weren't able to do at that moment. We were expecting it to be done Im immediately. And there, and there wasn't time to really figure out what had to be done, why, and how to do it in a manner that, that worked. And it's very difficult when you're being asked to be fit into a mold that you're not able to. And I think maybe you could explain this more. I think sometimes we think if people are on medicine or if we give them accommodations, it's going to fix everything. And I think that that's not the, the answer. So maybe you can add more. Yeah, so I think it really has to do with like, so for me, I had all the knowledge. So people were just confused why I wasn't getting it down. Like a multiple choice test, I could get a hundred on, but an at-home project I couldn't even get myself to do. And now looking back as I'm older, I have the skills. I know to um, have breaks when I'm doing a project, like do small pieces at a time. Like that wasn't explained to me. All was... All that was given to me is that you need to go to resource room, which I didn't need to go. I don't think I needed, to, I didn't want more school because I was already upset going to school. And it's not like I had trouble with information. It was actually just putting it down on a piece of paper. And I don't think anyone realized that. Um, even just, even myself at the time, I was confused why I wasn't doing my, my homework or my projects either. And I always say to parents um, of kids who learn differently that... Um, no, you, you were saying, I mean, like, what kinds of advice do you give to parents who learn differently? Is it that they learn to, that they need to sort of find a way either in in school or out of, out of school to learn really a lot of um, skills that involve executive functioning? I honestly think that from my, this is my opinion, I think parents have to focus less on diagnosing their kids and trying to fit them in some other mold and just let them be kids and really talk to them and try to figure out what exactly the issue is. Um, because throwing a bunch of things at them and a bunch of names is not gonna help your kid. It's gonna make them feel weird and awkward. And I don't think it actually helps. I think sometimes you just have to accept that you have a different mind and that's a good thing. And you just have to learn coping mechanisms to use your abilities to your advantage. Like ADHD, people with ADHD um, usually love to learn at, about things that they like and specific topics. Like I would get obsessed with gymnastics or I was really into anthropology when I was a kid. And I think just really honing in, into their interests instead of forcing them um, to do certain things, which is hard because... I mean, the schools were calling my parents and they were down their back. Um, it's kind of hard because the school system hasn't changed. So you really just kind of, I don't know, you have to learn ways to cope. Right. And I, you know, I want to kind of stress that. I mean, we're, we're, we are not here to um, bash teachers. Um, this is what Leah's experience was. So we're kind of just, you know, and we highly respect them because, I mean, I, I'm a speech language pathologist and I've worked in schools, but we're really here to, 
for Leah to kind of share her experience because it had a very, very negative impact on her. It had a very negative impact on, you know, our family, not now, but at the time, be, because even as parents, like, I mean, we didn't really understand what was happening. We didn't understand how someone could just all of a sudden hate being in school, why she all of a sudden just didn't seem, you know, overall happy, why she would come home from school and be like mentally exhausted. You know, obviously there was no time to finish homework because, her, you know, so much energy was just being spent, right? I mean, so much energy was just being spent trying to get to school. And I don't know if you mind me saying this or not, but there was a time in middle school where Leah just all of a sudden must have been home for about a month and a half, maybe more. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay to say. I mean, honestly, I blocked out a lot of middle school because I just felt so attacked. And um, I don't want to bash t teachers because I know they do amazing things. And I think I think it's just bigger than teachers. It's It's just trying trying to fit every single kid into a certain mold and no one was asking me what's wrong no one took the time to be like leah is everything okay the automatic response was to just yell at me um but maybe that's also the frustration on the teacher's part because when they look at me i mean nothing looks wrong with me i'm a social person i go out with my friends so they see me doing well in these other areas but just, and doing well on tests, but just not doing my homework. So I think there's just like a confusion of what was going on with me. And I know now um, schools are, they're more aware of what ADHD is and they help kids more. It was a little different when I was younger. It just It just really affected my self-esteem and my relationship with school to this day. Um, yeah. And you know, I think, you know, also parents are in a hard spot because we're being emailed and it's, I was being emailed more than the, you know, as the, the, the mom and, you know, the parent portal, I think came into play when you were in high school or maybe when Samantha was in high school. I don't know, but I never really looked at it a lot. And when the parent portal came into play for a parent to just constantly look at it and see that missing homeworks are there and have no way to help and get, you know, emails. It's, it creates a lot of stress at home. And, um, you know, obviously we went, you know, outside of the schools, we got you reading help. We got you as much help as we thought was needed. Um, but I do think there has to be a team effort. And I think it's a really important message. If you see someone in the hallway and they're really happy and they're social and then all of a sudden they're in a math class and their heads down and they're not really interested, we need to look more because we know that people with, you know, ADHD, hyper, focus and they're more, you know, interested in things that are, I mean, I, I think honestly, m m most of us are, most of us are more, you know, interested in things that are high interest. So what do you think? Because, you know, right now you're at Hofstra, um, you're amazing. You did amazing. You got a scholarship to get into Hofstra. Um, what do you think has changed all these years later? Um, I think it's a lot of things. Um, I think I used to kind of, I got my way through high school. I was able to pull off good grades, even though I wasn't handing in homework. I got good grades on tests. I got good grades on my ACT. I, got to, I went to college um, at University of Albany, and I realized you can't do that. In college, you really need to learn executive functioning, executive executive functioning skills, and how to organize. Um, so I ended up coming home, even though I loved it there, and 
I really needed to work on those skills. So I ended up going to community college and I really took a step back, took one class at a time and learned the best way for me to learn. So I really just did it on my own. Um, and I, I always, what I always say, especially with kids who grow up in the special ed system, no kid wants to fail. Everyone wants to succeed. No one feels good failing. No one's showing up to school and being like, I just don't care. There's usually a reason behind the, I don't care because they, they feel defeated. Um, and I just finally wanted to prove my self-worth because I knew I had potential I knew I was smart and I really just wanted to see myself succeed and it was something important for me to succeed academically because I come from an academic family. Um, my sister's really smart, went to a good school, she's in a doctorate program and I just wanted to prove to myself that I could do it and I think just like you know humans we there's like we have our will to keep going and I think every young person wants to do something amazing with their life. And I knew I had some great purpose or that's what I hoped for when I was little. And I just really wanted to make like young me happy. Yeah, you know, as a mom and an interviewer, this is so emotional because I've seen the process evolve. Um, and it really is amazing. There were many, many, many hard years, but I think Leah, your message is right. And I can say this as a coach myself, I can say it as someone who, you know, struggled with communicating. People want to succeed. Um, you don't usually walk into school and say, you know what, um, I'm not in.